I want to bring in world-renowned psychiatrist, Harvard-trained, you know, book-writing, brilliant author, Dr. Peter Bregan. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to join Del, us. Del, I've been listening for half an hour. It's the best, most insightful presentation I've ever heard in this entire area. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. We have a very fortunate audience. Brilliant, brilliant presentation. I'll give you the five Never said that before on TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So in a world, you know, I actually have a relative that can't get out of the house without, you know, they, they take these showers where they use a whole bar of soap, scrub their skin off. And it just seems to me as you walk around seeing people with masks, that used to be the image that we had of Howard Hughes, a man who could have had all of the freedom in the world, but was trapped by this fear of disease, this fear that everybody and everyone you touch, you're touching all these other people. Um, am I wrong? What is, the, what is the definition actually of hypochondria? A hypochondria is an obsessive fear that you're sick when you're not sick. Okay, and then Simple. OCD, that, that thing where people like, you know, they have to wipe every doorknob and uh, how is that described uh, clinically? Well, in many ways, it's sim similar to hypochondria because there's this underlying anxiety, which is making you afraid of things that aren't real in your life. So uh, in OCD, the fears are that you left the gas on, you left the door open, severe cases of I've had patients who are afraid they'd run over a dog every time they came to the, uh, oh, to wow. the office. So it's not so just based it, it, on cleanliness. It can go into a lot of different fear of, of not being in control of a world that is out of control. Well, that's right. And you're absolutely right that this is fear mongering. I think, well, you didn't say that, but I mean, this is fear mongering that is stimulating all kinds of anxieties in people. And I think the worst manifestation is probably going to be paranoia because a lot of people are afraid of what the government's doing. They've been afraid for a long time. They're afraid of society. And to some extent, that's healthy and normal, but it can also become disabling where you can't function. And, and these fears are really about going out into the whole world, whether we can trust the government, whether we can trust our doctors. So it's, it's the peddling of fear and I believe it has a purpose. I don't think it's accidental. The more afraid a population is, Dell, the more you can control it. Everybody who's ever wanted to control their own population has had to instill in them the fear of war, the fear of pestilence, the fear of witches, uh, whatever is uh, at the time going to work. And uh, the real question is, uh, you know, will we be brave enough to say no more? I think a lot of us who are patriotic and freedom loving went along with this in the beginning, Dell. We said, uh, this is a good thing. We'll cooperate. We'll, we'll put aside our personal responsibility. We'll put aside our tremendous feelings of uh, wanting to be free for the sake of the community. But now it's becoming apparent that this is becoming more and more for the sake of the drug companies, for uh, the sake of the vaccine companies. You did a marvelous job talking about that. It's for the sake of the elite. It is right. certainly not populist. It's not for the ordinary folks. This is all about the wealth and the control of the elite. When you watch the news, I mean, and, and I know that you're intelligent enough to see the data I've been looking at and reporting. On fact, you've been doing your own reporting on your own. Uh, you have websites where people can read about COVID-19. But when you watch the news now, I mean, mainstream news, and at a time where people are locked in their houses, they're absorbing even more of this than they ever had before. All day long, the news is telling you that, you know, you can't go out there. You know, Donald Trump is making a mistake by letting anyone open, open too soon. My God, we're going to have a rise in deaths. There's going to be a spike. There's going to be a spike. We're going to have a relapse. It's going to come in the fall. This won't be gone. We can't get back to our normal life until we have a vaccine. When you hear all of that, I mean, it is, is there any other way to describe that than fear mongering? And for you, you know, that has, you know, watched media for many, many years, has there ever been a Man. moment in America where media is being used to truly paralyze us in fear? 
I don't think so. In fact, what I'm seeing now, which is a little bit new in, in this extreme, is that fake science is being produced to have the fake media develop what is becoming increasingly a fake epidemic. Not that it is not real, real deaths. Let me say that, the, that I'm 84 years old. I'm the real object. I'm the one who is going to get killed by this if I get it, a good likelihood of it. I don't think we should lock down the country to keep us older people safe. Us older people should keep ourselves safe. We should stay at home. We shouldn't go out in large groups. We should eat healthy and lose weight and do all the things to protect ourselves. That, though, would cut this estimated 0.2% death right. rate to a fraction of that because most of the deaths are in people my age and we're closing down the society essentially for people of my age. I really agree with you 100% uh, 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 that for the average American 40 years old or 30 years old, the death rate is much lower than this 0.2%. And for yeah. our youngsters in college, it's a tiny fraction of the 0.2%. Six percent. So, it's even it's as bad as you were saying. And add in the age factor, and that whoa, add in the age factor, and it becomes even larger. I, and I think though you are doing, uh, and Jeffrey, oh my God, you guys are doing a wonderful job. I'm really glad to to be uh, here Thank to support you. you, and you're supporting what I'm saying too. Well, let me just ask you one last question because you know I have been really harping on the fact that from the beginning the death rate was in the 65 and older with also other comorbidities. Remember, people say 65 and older. There's plenty of people. We've seen people that are 90 years old that are surviving just fine. I have, a, I have someone that works on my show whose uh, grandfather was over the age of 90 um, and did just fine with this, uh, and, and no one knew it, just saw the antibodies. But... You know, I get accused of saying, well, I mean, you're, you're against old people then. You just keep saying, lock down the old people, and, and, and you don't seem to care about the rest of the country. But I want to be clear, and I want to know if you understand this too, because you start wondering, am I not, is anyone seeing the same news? The understanding we had around the world was you, we were going to lock down to try and flatten the curve. The idea of that to be to just slow down for that acute group, that, that very tiny group. We didn't want to overrun the ERs all at once, which Sweden did this very well, right? They just slowed the spread. They still allowed the spread because we're trying to get to herd immunity. Is there, is there a way I need to better language this so that people over the age of 65 understand that here's my point. Just like you said, lock yourself down and lock it tight. Let's figure out a way to hermetically seal food that's delivered to you and take care of you for about 30 days, 60 days max. Meanwhile, the other 99.74% of us that are not going to have massive complications from this illness, let's get out, let's catch this cold so that I can invite Peter Bregan out to throw the Frisbee next week because we now have herd immunity. What is it? How are they getting away with essentially a war against herd immunity and now they're going to try and start making it that we're just against old people. So better to, you know, bubble wrap the entire population than just this small group over the age of 65. How, how, do, I, how do I language this better? Well, maybe, maybe it's better to have somebody older language it, you know. My household, my wife is 69. I'm 84. Her mother-in-law, I love her. She lives with us. She's 92. We will take care of ourselves. The government doesn't even have to worry about it. We have the information. But let the government speak to those of us who are older and say, we're opening up now, but not for you. I haven't heard anybody dare say that. I think I might be the first one to suggest it. We're opening up, but older folks, we think you should really take care of yourself. We're going to make sure you got enough food, make sure that the people are coming to your house and dropping off stuff. Because as I'm so happy to watch... The, the, a lot of the people here in Ithaca, they're just opening it up on them, their own. They're going out. And I'm glad to see it. But I'm not going to do that. I right. may stay sequestered long after everything opens up because I'm so vulnerable. Don't ruin the society under the pretext. And besides, that's a bunch of nonsense. In my state, the, the older people were targeted by uh, Cuomo. I mean, he slaughtered yes. old people by sending them into the nursing homes. Yeah. And it just spread like wildfire. 
I think you're doing a great, a, a, a really a good job with this. And I think the folks should just be listening to you. And maybe we should get more older folks talking. I don't think they want us on television. They don't want us on television saying, hey, we want, we want the younger people out there living. We're the main targets. Take care of us. Can I add one fact that hasn't sure. come up? Yeah. There has never been a vaccine for a coronavirus. The cold is a coronavirus. You don't think that the drug companies would just give anything for a virus, uh, for a vaccine for the cold? And we got together with China, believe it or not. I, I don't know if you've covered this. It's on my website. We actually, with China, went ahead and developed violent viruses paid for by Fauci and NIH. Uh, when we announced it, uh, we got this huge spike in and the day two after, would, um, Trump actually cut off funding to this. But we were literally giving a country like China deadly viruses that were very, very uh, yeah. useful as, as weapons. And um, we, we just, we've just got to start thinking about really taking care of, of us. We really, yeah. really need to do that. And we can't bet on a vaccine. What I wanted, the connection I wanted to make is the excuse for getting together with Chinese from Wuhan. They were Wuhan physicians yeah. and PhDs. We got together with these Wuhan folks. The excuse was so we can make a vaccine. So what did they find when they developed this SARS coronavirus? They built, it's not the one we got now, but they built us with the Chinese, a SARS coronavirus. What'd they find? For a full page, they explained they could not develop a good treatment and no vaccine. And the vaccine was making the, the uh, animals worse. The Absolutely. vaccine We've was making so the much animals about that. worse. You know, obviously, and it is great to actually have someone from a, from a generation that has seen more than I ever have to be here speaking to the people. We're going to do this more often, Dr. Bregan. I really want to thank you for taking the time. And anyone can go to Dr. Bregan's website, and he's putting out lots of information on this from a clinical perspective with all the background. Uh, let's go ahead and support those that are bringing us the truth. Uh, it's an honor to have you, Dr. Bregan, on my show, and I look forward to doing it very, uh, sometime very soon in the future. If you like that clip, then be sure to check out our live broadcast of The High Wire every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.